Thank you very much for attending this webinar and this is our very first one. So we hope we, we are going to organize more uh, similar events in the future. Today we are very happy to have uh, Dr. Zhao Lietao from EWAC to talk about his research in uh, Hezgong cellular automatic models. And so he is going to give you about 20 minutes presentation and could you please uh, mute your microphone during his presentation? And if you have any question, please uh, type in the conversation windows. And then we will collect the question, and Zhao will answer the question after his presentation. And thank you very much. And so, shall we start it, Zhao? Yes. Hello, Albert. I'm ready. Yes, please. Hello? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. It really depends on where you are watching and also when you are watching this presentation, because uh, I think Albert is uh, planning to share this presentation um, slides and also is recording the my voice, so you'll be able to, to listen and watch this presentation uh, later on. So, as Albert uh, has mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about... Uh, urban flood models based on auto cellular automata. And the, the innovation part of this is that it relies on hexagonal uh, meshes. So this would be uh, the topic for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. So let's uh, go briefly through the outline of uh, this presentation. I will give a short introduction to cellular automata models then move into the CADIS and um, WCA 2D model, flood model. Then um, discuss a little bit why hexagons, what are, are the advantages and disadvantages compared to squares. Uh, present a case study, some results uh, and discussion, and then uh, some findings, summary of the findings, and also point to uh, other ongoing developments. Okay, starting with a short introduction to cellular autom automata. The idea um, started in mid um, in the 1950s or late 40s uh, with the Janos uh, von Neumann and Stanisch uh, Wau Wulam. And uh, I think uh, in, if you read about cellular automata, uh, many credit the, the cellular automata to von Neumann. <clears throat> And uh, the other application, well, he was develop, developing or thinking about cellular automata. Okay, I see that some issues with hearing me. Is it better now? Um, so oh. von Neumann was thinking about cellular automata to build a self-replicating self machine. Uh, but only in the 1970s, uh, John Conway came to to uh, an application of the cellular automata, um, and it's the famous game of life. And unfortunately, I think you cannot see the, the picture moving or the figure moving in the screen, uh, but I, I hope that uh, in, the, um, in the version that Albert will share, you can, you can see the, the cellular automata moving. So it's really basic, the game of life. It only has two states. It's uh, one cell can be dead or alive. It's white or black. Uh, it only has also only three rules. So the rules are very simple. Um, if have less than two neighbors alive, then the cell will die. More than three neighbors um, they will also die, but when it has actually exactly three neighbors, it will come alive. So these are basically what is involved in a cellular automata. It has a set of rules, a set of states, and also the grid where these things happen. Now moving to a more physically uh, or more interesting uh, cellular automata. The CADIS and the WCA 2D mod flood model has been developed by the colleagues at Exeter. Well, Albert is part of the development team. Um, you can access uh, information about the CADIS on the 
uh, uh, link that you see in the slide, and also there are several publications that present and discuss the results about the caddies. So what is CADIS and what is uh, WCA 2D model? Uh, well, CADIS is a Solar Automata API. It's a high-performance um, API written in uh, C++. It's open source library. It implements a few classes like grid box, function clock, etc. Uh, it's ready to compile for diverse backends. And it also has a focus on parallel computing. And um, as far as I know, the, one of the big responsibles for these is Mike Gibson. Uh, that is, in part of his PhD, has been developing these OpenMP and OpenCL multi-core um, options for the caddies. Um, the, the WCA2D is an application that is built on the, the API. <clears throat> And basically, it's a flood model that applies a numeric simplification of the Manning's equation. It's a weight-based uh, system for intercellular water transfer. It is meant to be high performance while maintaining the accuracy of the results. And the main simulation results are water depth and flow velocity. So a little bit more detail on the on the flood model, on the caddies, and uh, on the rules of the weighted uh, solar automata 2D, two-dimensional flood model. So basically, it uses um, the von Neumann no uh, neighborhood in, in, in square uh, grids. As you can see here in the slide, there's a center cell and four neighbor cells, the orthogonal cells. And the water basically will flow from the center cell to the neighbor cells. This is done via a weighted um, rule. As you can see here, is part of uh, one of the publications recently by the team at Exeter. And then it has also a simple rule or an equation that rules the velocity from one cell to the neighboring cells. And this um, equation has into account the water mass that needs to be spread to the neighboring cells, the time step, the cell edge length, and the water depth. And this is, again, based on these simplified rules that uh, then we get um, flood flood results, water depths and velocities. So this is a really short introduction about the flood model. Um, as I mentioned, these solar automata, they, they work on spaces or grids. And for the WCA2D, there are two, three spaces. One is for the water levels and two for the velocities, one for the direction north-south, and then another one for the direction east-west. Okay, so now let's move into why hexagons. Why should we think about hexagons for cellular automata? Well, one well-known issue with uh, squares when used for, for grids is the it's, it's an isotropy which means that uh, different directions have different uh, relations, or the center cell have different relations among the eight neighbor cells, for example, is one thing. The other thing is the border paradox that we can simplify here with this von Neumann neighborhood on the top left and the Moore, which has considers the eight neighbors of the center cell. And then on the right, if we consider the von Neumann neighborhood, uh, I would say that uh, that polygon, that green uh, polygon, it's it's closed. But what happens if we consider the moor? Is it open or is it closed? And then we move to hexagons. And then hexagons, they solve uh, some of these issues. Well, actually, they solve these two issues. So one cell is surrounded by its six neighbors. Um, and with, if we talk about regular grids, these six neighbors are um, at the same distance from the center cell. Uh, and also the, the relation is the same uh, in every uh, six directions. There's more to that. Well, when we consider um, the same resolution, uh, with hexagons, we'd need uh, slightly less um, elements, so about 13.4%. So we might gain something in terms of computation efficiency. 
uh, okay, this is this was basically the reasons why we'd like to to experiment and explore hexagons um, for the solar automata. And in order to do that, um, Luis uh, de Souza, which is sitting really next to me today, uh, and myself, um, we developed some uh, specification to store and to and to work with hexagons in uh, geographic information science environment. And uh, Luis called these uh, eggs ASCII, and basically it's a text file that stores information about the format of the hexagons and also the actual values of for each hexagon. And you can see here an example, a simple example of this uh, format and how the data can be stored. So we, uh, based on these um, format, uh, data format um, developments, we moved on and to, to change the WCA 2D flood model. And here we have already a few changes. So for the center cell, we have six neighbors, first thing, obvious, using hexagons, but we need an extra um, space for the velocity. So here we have three directions as you can see in the slide. So we need, we have a extra complexity for using hexagons in this uh, solar automata model. Um, moving um, into the case study, we used for these preliminary tests, the EAT8A test that is proposed or presented by Nelson Pender in the 2D benchmark reports from uh, Environment Agency in the United Kingdom. It, is, uh, it has two types of inflow events, a rain and also an inflow event that can mimic uh, manhole surcharge or, uh, or uh, mains, water supply mains uh, break. Uh, it is, uh, the DM is based in real topography. It uh, occupies an area by something about 1,000 by 400 meters. And the resolution of the cells is about um, four square meters, which means it's a two by two meters a square cell. Um, here um, are the two DMs we used for, for this study. One is the original DM, the squares on the top. And in order to uh, use the DM for the, um, for the, to test the hexagonal, Cellular automata. We need we needed to resample the um, the squared uh, DEM uh, using a multi quadratic uh, interpolation special interpolation method, and then uh, use the same the the area of each cell in the hexagon or the area of each hexagon has the same area of the the square. So we are using here squares with uh, four square meters, and uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, when you look into these two DMs, it's really, really difficult to find any differences. So in principle, they represent the same surface. So moving now to these uh, first results. Okay, um, computation time. We are just using one single processor and for the squares, this uh, case study runs uh, in 18 minutes. 25 seconds, while for the hexagons, it takes a little bit longer. It's about 30% more time when compared to the squares, uh, squared version of the, the flood model. And this is due to uh, these extra velocities space. So here we could not see any benefit in terms of computational time using hexagons, but possible to shorten these difference uh, difference if we consider um, multi-core or if we take into account that uh, same uh, uh, bigger hexagons might, might represent the same resolution as uh, squares. Then uh, we also analyze the flooded uh, extent and we here we consider just areas over 100 square meters with more than 50 centimeters water depth. And again, or here we could not see almost, we cannot see almost any difference. So in terms of flood extent, it is very, very similar. The results of the two case studies of the two um, implementations, the squares and the hexagons. 
Also the same for the water depth, um, squares on top, hexagons on the bottom of the figure or the slide. And here also um, the results are very, very, very similar. You might notice some difference in colors and it's because of the rendering of the figures. So the hexagons have a different type of rendering than the squares. But the results, if we analyze cell by cell, these are uh, pretty much the same. OK, and up to this point, I'll go back one slide. We were a little bit OK. Um, hexagons are fine, nice properties. Uh, the results are more or less the same, but it takes more time to run the hexagonal implementation of the caddies than the square implementation. So there's no big gain into considering uh, hexagons. So then we moved on to analyze the flood velocity or the flow velocity. And here, surprisingly, the results, the difference start to appear. And uh, as you can see in this slide, uh, the results are pretty different. So we can, we see much more yellowish and reddish areas in the bottom uh, figure, which re represents the results from the hexagons, than on the top uh, figure. And this was quite uh, interesting and also motivating to pursue the, uh, the study. <clears throat> so a little bit more detail on the, on the differences on the velocities. As you can see here, in the, in the greenish uh, plot you have uh, that represents the, the square results have much more cells with lower velocities than the, the hexagons on the this reddish um, plot which is of course is expected somehow after looking into the the maps this is for the peak velocity for the Low velocity at uh, 600 seconds of the simulation have uh, a similar similar result, and the same for the 2,400 seconds of the simulation. And here in the these box plots on the right, you can see, um, sorry, that uh, the velocities are much, there's some cells with much higher velocity than in hexagons than in squares. And this is quite, or can be quite relevant when we look into uh, the flood risk, for example, that takes into account, or might take into account, not only uh, water depth, but also flow velocity. So coming to um, the end of this short presentation, so, Yes, uh, as I mentioned before, hexagons are slower. This is due to one extra velocity space that is needed to to account for the third for a third uh, direction in the cellar automata. Flooded areas are very similar. Uh, this is due, I guess, to the terrain aspect um, that is the main driver for the flow, and this confirms that uh, while we had to um, to resample the hexagonal DM, it still represents a very, very similar surface. So these results can be really compared to, to each other. Although there are relevant uh, differences in water velocities. And this is quite interesting and it's, um, it deserves further uh, investigations. And one important question is the one in red in my slide. So, what is the impact when using uh, these results, the hexagonal results, um, to estimate flood risk as a function of water depth and flow velocity? So we are uh, working on this and we hope uh, to have uh, results soon. Um, as I mentioned, ongoing development. So we are exploring these, the, the impact of these hexagonal results on the, on the flood risk assessment, also important that here we only compared results from the squares and the hexagons, but it's very important to compare these results with a physically based model. And we are working um, now on that. Uh, also a question that we'd like to, to answer or find a, a clue for to, to answer these. Do the, does the, the, the low resolution grid uh, with the hexagons produce the same or similar results to 
the square automata or to the physically based model? Well, it's a question. We are also working on that. And then um, just uh, a side topic, we'd like to continue developing the Exas key tools uh, further and also bring other applications from other domains to use these hexagonal uh, grids. So that's it. Thanks a lot. Just um, a final remark. We, we have these uh, developments available um, and information about the projects on these two links. Um, I would like to thank again the team at Exeter, Albert, Mike, and uh, Professor Dragon Savage um, with the support for developing these, and also Louise, that has been the, the main uh, driver for this development. So that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention. And now I think it's we have a few minutes for questions and comments. Thank you. Albert. Thank you very much, Joe. Um... Any question from the audience? I think you are also concentrating for listening to his presentation, so nobody has typed anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, Joe, can I ask, start with the first question? That uh, when you talk about this velocity, so are you looking at the components for on the each interface, or you you are looking at the resulting uh, velocity for a cell. I'm looking into a resulting velocity for a cell in a similar way that uh, squares um, calculate the velocity for or the resulting velocity for for the cell. Okay. Yeah. So more more questions. Hi there, it's Matt Roberts from BMT. Um, I was just wondering whether you'd validated some of the results to see whether the increase in the velocities that you're noticing with a hexagonal grid uh, rather than the quad grid um, are, are real, whether that increase is actually real. Is that okay. part of the physically based modeling that you're, you're about to do next? Yes, actually, well, this is really, this presentation is really about just this preliminary results. I can tell you that uh, we have done this comparison uh, now with a physically based model uh, and what we can see is that the, the velocities that we are getting uh, with the hexagonal grid are closer to those velocities that we get from with uh, with the physically based model so in that sense I would tend to say that for the velocities the hexagonal implementation it's it's closer to the physically based model Okay, do you have any thoughts on, on why that is? Um, is it to do with sort of averaging just over the, the two in, uh, two directions in the quad um, and therefore not peaking up the maxes? It, 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 when you did the comparisons before, was that the maximums um, everywhere okay. at any time? No, actually we are comparing for these, for the peak of the velocities and also for the two or three different time steps of the simulation. In, in our opinion, um, and uh, I opened these for Luis is here, just as, as, as I mentioned, uh, right next to me, and then Albert and Mike, I saw Mike here also commenting. You can feel free to comment on these. Um, the point is, if I go back to this equation, so I, uh, give me just, if I go back to this equation, what happens is that if, if we keep almost everything constant in this equation, and if we change from squares to hexagons, the cell edge will be different, right? Different and small. Different and smaller. So this has an impact on the velocity. I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, yeah, in part. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes, I, I have one, if I if I may. Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Joao, for the presentation. Um, what about the possibility of um, changing the dimension of the grid in some part of the domain? If you have a square uh, cells, that's quite easy. But with the hexagons, then you have problems to have some part of the domain with a smaller cell 
and some other part of the domain with a larger, a broader information. Is it oh. correct, or we may try to find something? I okay. I, I see. I think I understand your your question. Quite interesting. By the way, is uh, is who is asking this? Is Gabriele? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Gabriele, my my our understanding here from 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 Eteavag. So, what you've been doing? Um, it is. If I understand it correctly, you are talking about um, irregular meshes with squares, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So squares, but keeping the same number of neighbors. Is that correct or completely? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, that's right. So if that's the case, I think that the the problem is very similar when we look into squares and hexagons. I, I see this is quite similar. We've just um, we've been thinking about it. Uh, there's a way to stretch uh, hexagonal um, grids or meshes the same way as we can do this with squares. Okay, so that that's possible to stretch that a little bit. Yes, yes. Um, just let me add that for the current version of uh, the caddies, I think it's not yet possible because it works only in regular grids. Okay. But it's something that we are considering to to also investigate in the in the very near future. So it's not necessary to have regular hexagons in the in the mesh. It's well, not strictly necessary, so to speak. At the moment, should, yes. Yes, that's yeah. At the moment, yes. In the future, we'd like to bring uh, irregular sizes for the mesh. I think it's a good idea. It's something that we wrote uh, something about that uh, recently. But we have to, to really do the work. So we, there's no work, as far as we know, that has been done in this in this direction. But yes, oh. it's possible. OK, OK, thank you, thank you. Uh, any more questions? I see Mike has typed some question about the, the angle, the, the degree of the headstone grid. So I'm reading why are the hexagonal grids at 15 degrees. So I don't understand the question. Hexagonal grids are f at 15 degrees. What Mike does? What does mine Mike so, mean with that? Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, please, Mike. Hi. So yes, the um, slide you had specifying the hex grid, the ASCII hex grid. It showed mm -hmm. it was at 15 degrees. Okay, okay, okay. Can you go now back to that slide? Yeah, okay. This is just to exempt to, to show that we can uh, turn the, the grid. We can have the grid uh, with zero degrees. Okay. So this is just to, to show that with this uh, format, with this specification, we can rotate the hexagonal grid. It doesn't have uh -huh. to be aligned with the uh, x axis, for example. But uh, for this specific case, we used uh, the hexagonal grid the same direction as the square grid, so parallel to the x uh, axis. OK. So yes, my other question was about the EAT test that we, we've done. Mm -hmm. You said you kept the area of the cells the same, but how many cells was in the hex grid compared to the square grid? Did that? OK. Yeah. Because it changes depending on the interpolation yeah. method, of I, course. Honestly, I don't have a, a definitive answer to your question. I think it's a good one, and I'll try to, to answer. Uh, we have slightly more hexagons in, this hex, in the hexagonal grid than in the squares, okay. because we have to cover a little bit the borders of the, of the area. Yeah. Okay, so I don't know exactly how many cells we have. We have a few more. Well, okay. a few hundred more. So, of course, I think that could add to the, the slowdown on it. Could and be. Yeah, my, my last question, of course, so I've done some work with the, the trade-off on the, the speed of the square grids, uh, where we can speed them up by using a, a larger time step up to a point where the quality drops off. Mm -hmm. Do we think the uh, hex grid would have more speed whilst maintaining quality. 
Okay. Um, what I think uh, you are asking is that uh, can we use bigger cells if we consider hexagons uh, and then keep the same quality in the results when compared with the squares? Is that use correct? Use a, a bigger time step a and time step. still maintain the, the overall quality. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I don't have a... Work I've done with the square grids, we'll obviously need to, to talk okay. about that. Mike, I, I don't know. It's a good question. It's really worth investigating and pursuing that. Good point. Right, yeah, so I don't answer. have an answer, sorry, <laughs> for that. <laughs> okay, I think we about to run out of time. So can we take the last question that Soboden just typed to, in the okay. text file? Sure, can you reply this? Which one we Slobodan? Slobodan just typed? Yeah, yeah. Would it be interesting to investigate how much difference between velocities resulting from two types of grids depends on terrain slope? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think so. Definitely. Uh, good point, Slobodan, as usual. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this comment and, and also suggestion. So, I think so. Uh, it might have uh, implications in the results, not only perhaps in the in the velocities, but also in the in the water depths. I don't know because with uh, with hexagons, usually we can get much more detail with the same number of uh, because they are a little bit more round, right? So it's worth definitely worth investigating. Yes. Excellent. So I think we have run out of time. So thank you everyone again for attending this webinar. So, uh, yeah. so thanks it's, a lot for the questions. Thanks a lot for Xiao for his excellent presentation. It's very interesting and gives a very good beginning of our webinar series. And as you, we said earlier that we, because there are audience from different part of the world, so we are trying to organize some time better for uh, maybe in the future but the, for the next two uh, webinar they will be held at the same time on 15th of May by uh, P Professor jo uh, Giuseppe Aronica at the Uni um, University of Messina and then followed by the uh, webinar on 12th of June uh, presented by Dr. George uh, George Lieta, uh, sorry, George, George Lieta. And so if you, any of you are interested to give a talk to share your idea about this, uh, what you are doing, so please contact me so we can organize some uh, other uh, webinar for you. And also, if you would, if you, uh, uh, please follow us from all these kind of social media in on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook, you can just search UFR. UFMRM, then you will find us. And thank you very much again for participating in this uh, webinar. Thank you. See you next time. And finally, sorry, the all this will be recorded, as Joel said, when we will share this video and the slide on the website via the social media. Thank you. Thanks.